Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's 1 million by 1 million strategy roundtable for entrepreneurs. 1 million by 1 million, as you know, is the first and only global virtual incubator accelerator in the world, headquartered in the heart of Silicon Valley, right off Sand Hill Road. And our mission is to help a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars in annual revenue and beyond, build a trillion dollars in global GDP and 10 million jobs. So in support of that mission, we do all sorts of different kinds of work. And I will uh, spend some time later on in the program explaining to you uh, what those services or what those programmings are. And uh, first, though, we're going to spend uh, a good chunk of the session working with five entrepreneurs. We had a massive registration for today somehow. I mean, this is the last... Uh, Roundtable of the summer, normally it tends to be a little low, but we had massive registration. So some of you who registered to pitch today, we had to move you over to the next roundtable or even perhaps to the one after that. So um, anyway, we do have five uh, who have sent in slides and are ready to go. Uh, if you are live tweeting the show, please use hashtag 1M1M. And... Uh, our Twitter handles are at 1M by 1M and at Romana. You're very welcome to follow us because we do make a very concerted attempt to put really serious, high-quality content through the channels. The YouTube channel, 1M 1M Roundtables, has recordings of all our previous roundtables, and this one will go on there as well. Um, these are the call-in instructions. I don't know how much time we're going to have to do um, you know, open microphone today. But uh, we will, I will put this up. If we do have time, I will put this instructions up again. We're going to start today with Sanjeev Sharma. Sanjeev, if you could unmute your line and tell us what you're doing, that would be great. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm a doctor by training, and, and so this is a little different. Uh, I've performed or uh, participated in webinars before, so uh, pardon my... Uh, um, infancy, okay? Um, but I want to attack a um, fairly common problem. Uh, I think uh, since this is a webinar that is done globally, uh, travel, of course, is uh, something that's become uh, cheaper over time. Many of us have probably traveled abroad, come back with uh, pockets full of loose change. Next slide, please. Most of that change goes in a jar or a drawer. Um, Visa Europe um, does an annual review of travel through the uh, EU 28 countries. And in 2010, they estimated that 900 million sterling pounds of amassed unused currency by UK travelers was stuck away in, in similar jars. Uh, only 5% was estimated to be changed back into currency that was used. Next slide. World travel, as, as I said uh, just a little while ago, is, is growing. Uh, this is uh, uh, both online and offline travel. There's projected growth worldwide. Uh, varies within region. Next slide, please. Uh, as you can see, within region there is variance, but uh, there is uh, uh, prospective growth worldwide for uh, travel. Next slide. Uh, I um, honed in on uh, what happens in the EU 28 countries, and um, of 245 million travelers in 2012, majority of them outbound out of their own country, traveled to another European country. Majority was either their own private car or rental car. But quite a few number of people use airplanes, trains. Next slide. Uh, of the um, global market in terms of uh, companies providing ATM, uh, ATMs um, that vary in, in, in really what they what they. Do, but uh, only Wincor Nixdorf, as you see on the slide, um, that's the only company that provided a coin recycling ATM, and they have recently have spoken to their 
um, European as well as American headquarters, they've um, really stopped producing that uh, ETM. Next slide. Some of us, uh, I think uh, uh, most of the panelists today are um, in the U.S., but um, I think one is in the U.K., and we're all familiar with these machines put out by a company called Outerwall. They own Coinstar and Redbox. Coinstar allows a person to deposit coins for recycling. You're either given a receipt that you can take to the cashier at the grocery store and, and be reimbursed. You can uh, change the money into a digital account through PayPal, or you can give it to charity. Uh, predominantly, um, Otterwall does single currency recycling. Next slide. So really, my um, idea or a desire is really to solve that simple issue of what happens to people coming home with a pocket full of change Majority of people will try to do a mad dash at the airport to spend all the currency they may have so they're not left with this pocket full of change. Um, there's a, I, I believe there's considerable potential uh, not only in Europe but, but worldwide. The reason I, I chose to kind of focus on Europe was their uniformity with the use of the euro um, in the UK, um, uh, um, they they specifically deal with pounds, but I, I think that um, the kind of hurdles that I, I, I find is, um, you know, do I uh, work with um, a company such as Outerwall or eBay to bring my idea to market, or work with a company to start from the scratch and, and uh, develop uh, an ATM that could do multiple um, currencies in terms of coin recycling. I think there's uh, potential uh, revenue from uh, participating in foreign exchange. There's uh, considerable I'm going to um, stop you there and start giving you some feedback. First and foremost, uh, have you traveled to British Airways? British Airways, no. British Airways provides an envelope where you can put whatever currency of whatever country, it doesn't matter, and they take it and give it to charity. I think it's, the partnership is with UNICEF or something. So what you're saying about giving to charity is something that British Airways does provide an option for. Now, what you are trying to do is, you know, on a more universal scale, and I think the problem is absolutely bang on. I, ha I do travel a lot and, and internationally, and, and I'm very familiar with the problem, and anybody who travels internationally is very familiar with the problem. Um, I would suggest to, that you think about, instead of trying to put physical um, you know, ATMs or boxes uh, at various physical locations, if you could just put together um, some sort of an uh, online service where people can mail in maybe a bunch of a box of stuff and, and this could be diverse currencies you sort out and and uh, change and, and do whatever all these options that you're talking about PayPal um, credit charity, all of these options and you can if you can do that centrally and mostly digitally without having to deal with Hardware deployment, it would be a much, much easier project to bring to bear. Okay. Okay. So that's, um, I believe that you have uh, recently joined the 1M1M Premium Program, right? I have. So based on what I just said, if you could now build up your idea using the 1M1M curriculum, but thinking of it as, a, as an online service, and, I, and we, I will will. Work, we will work with you to flesh it out and, and build up the business. Great. I will do that. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Um, so before I move to the next presentation, um, there's somebody who's sending private messages to me about 
technical issues, dial in phone number, audio, and so forth. So I can't do technical support and you know work with entrepreneurs, right? <laughs> if, if you have issues, I suggest you just send it to public chat, send to all participants, and then Maureen is there in the uh, room. She's going to help you sort out whatever issues you have. But don't send them, send private messages to me. I just can't, you know, I don't have that much multitasking horsepower to be able to coach entrepreneurs and in real time do tech support for you. Okay, next up is Deepan Chakravarti. Hi, uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, great. So uh, I'm the found, one of the founders at Hashcube. We are a mobile and social gaming company. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide again. Yeah. Okay. So what we are good at is monetizing casual games like Sudoku or 2048 or Solitaire, Mahjong. So if you look at these games in the market right now, they are primarily monetized using advertisements. 2048, for example, is primarily monetized using advertisements. Even Sudoku is monetized using advertisements. So we have something called Quest Model. If you download and play our game, you'll understand what Quest Model is better. But So what it actually does is we can take any game that is proven in the market, proven in terms of traction, but monetized using advertisements, put our Quest Model on top of it, then you would be able to monetize it 10x better. That's our strategy. Uh, so we have done that on top of... What is the what is the monetization model of Quest Model? Uh, so Quest, mo I'll actually talk about more in the later slides. But since you asked, so we sure. use in-app purchases to monetize okay. it. It it's a premium game with in-app purchases. Uh, I'll I'll talk about it more in the later slides. So we have this game called Sudoku Quest. It has one million users, uh, and there are other games. All games put together, we have three million users. Uh, we are a strong team of nine people based in, most of the team is based in Bangalore. I keep traveling back and forth from Valley to Bangalore. We are backed by Indian Angel Network and Blue Ventures. Uh, we're trying, trying to raise the next round right now. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the growth has been phenomenal. In fact, we did $20,000 in revenue in last month. Uh, so we have grown almost 10x in terms of revenue in the last 12 months. Uh, most of the growth has come after we launched our games on mobile. Uh, so you can see that MAU also has grown significantly. Uh, in, in Jan, we had a speak in monthly active users, primarily because Facebook featured us. And uh, after, after the feature got over, there was a small decline in monthly active user base, but there's a steady growth nevertheless. Um, so almost 60% of our revenue today comes from mobile and 40% from Facebook. We are there on iOS, Android, Amazon, Nokia, and Facebook. Next slide, please. Oof. So. The, the team has, me and Ram are the co-founders, Ram heads engineering, uh, I, I had the business aspect of the company, and Gurinder, actually he joined us two years before and he heads marketing. And apart from three of us, there is a strong team of six people. Uh, we are a nine people team right now. Next, next slide please. Next slide again. So, um, so I was talking about Quest model earlier. So uh, if you look at the casual games market, um, there are plenty of games that out there that can fit into the Quest model, and here you have monthly active users for these games. More than one billion people play these games every month, so the market is really huge. Um, next slide, please. So why are we best? I I actually already mentioned about this. We are able to monetize it. 10x better than the competition. So you can see Hashtube Sudoku here compared against all the other Sudoku apps in the App Store. Finger App Sudoku is the number one Sudoku and they just make one cent per download whereas we are able to make 50 cents per download. Um, and that's primarily happening because we use in-app purchases to monetize and our Quest model helps us monetize better whereas uh, everybody else in the market, uh, they're using advertisements, yeah. Deepan, the, um, the basic difference of what you're doing versus what some of the other apps are doing, other game, casual game apps are doing, is advertising versus free-to-play. Is that the main differentiator? Uh, I would go one more step. It's not just free-to-play. It's actually the Quest model. Uh, so Quest is actually, I mean, if you have played Candy Crush Saga, King actually builds Saga games. Candy Crush is one of those Saga games. So they also have Papa Pier Saga, Pet Rescue Saga, and a bunch of Saga games. So Quest is similar to Saga, and the difference, like you said, is 
we build games that are free to play and not they don't use ads to monetize uh, that said it's not easy to design a premium game so that's where our play comes in so uh, this is by the way um, you will see if you're uh, if you follow my blog regularly you will see very soon next week actually there's going to be a story coming up on Chion Worlds, and uh, you should read that. They, free to pay, free to play is actually monetizing substantially better than subscription or ad. You know, subscription yeah, that's true. is better than ads, and free to play is monetizing even better than subscription. That is, that is a, an industry trend. Yeah, I mean that, that's exactly. We are a case study for that. You can actually use us and say that free to play monetizes very well. Uh, we are going one step further, saying that we are free to play, but we focus on quests specifically as the strategy. I mean, you can build free to play games in like m multiple different ways, but but quest is a focus for us, and we think we can build up hundreds of quest games. You can build quest games using Solitaire, Mahjong, Crossword, 2048, Flappy Bird. So. Yeah, so I'll actually talk about, um, I mean, so if you look at the market right now, I mean, our strategy would be um, to identify games that work in the market and then do a quest on top of it. Um, okay, so let's this talk slide, those. But uh, these other games that you're talking about, do, is there any kind of intellectual property violation that you get into by taking other people's ideas? Uh, so... Solitaire and Sudoku are in the public domain. You can build games on it. I mean, Sudoku is trademarked in Japan, but the word is trademarked. As long as you call your game something as Sudoku Quest or number game or something, you are totally okay to do it. Um, whereas 2048, for example, I mean, you probably can't use the word 2048 if they have trademarked it or something, but the core mechanic of the game, nothing is patented or trademarked. Or Flappy Bird, for example, there are lots of clones out there. Same way 2048, there are lots of clones out there. So uh, there is, I mean, there is no intellectual property dispute in these cases. And how do you distribute with these three million users that you've managed to gather? How are how are you distributing? So uh, early on, most of our users came from Facebook. We actually capitalized on the growth growth of Facebook to get our users, but. Uh, lately, we are seeing a lot of growth on mobile. Um, mobile is our primary uh, growth channel right now. So our revenues have grown significantly after we launched on mobile, and mobile is where our tools are also much better. Um, so this particular slide that we have on the screen right now, you can see that. I mean, left that side of it talks about. Another true statement, by the way. Mobile is not where the ARPUs are best. The ARPUs are better on PC games. Nonetheless, you're seeing good trends in mobile, that's fine, but uh, PC games monetize better. Uh, actually, it depends on which category of games you're going after. When if you're talking about mid-core and hardcore games, I would definitely agree with what you said, but these are very casual games. When you have two minutes' time waiting for a train or an right. appointment or something, you would use these things. And yeah, so the nature of the game also matters. Uh, our highest paying user has paid us $3,000, whereas if you had made it a paid game, we would probably have priced it at $1 or $2. Uh, we would never be able to make that kind of a money from a single user. So premium or free to play is actually working really well. Um, In gaming, eight percent. Um, can we go back to the previous slide once again? I'm sorry. Yeah. So eight percent. Eight percent of our users pay us more than fifty dollars, and these people account for almost sixty-six percent of the revenue that we're making. Uh, so. Um, in essence, uh, this is a market where very few people are going to account for majority of the revenue. So our game design principle, I mean, when we design the games, we keep these users in mind and design games for these hardcore users. Um, yeah, so that's actually what is actually helping us monetize uh, paying users really well. Uh, next slide, please. So um, Facebook has, actually, has been helping us solve the distribution problem re really well. You can see the number of free users and various channels on Facebook that's leading to these free users, open graph, search, uh, Facebook recommendation. And, um, so these are the Facebook channels that are actually driving us a lot of free users. Next slide, please. Channels? Next slide, Facebook, please. You, are you acquiring uh, Facebook traffic by through some sort of a paid model, or are you doing this 
organically no whatever is mentioned here is all free organic users uh, of the 3 million users 99% of the users we have are organic uh, going forward the strategy that we have is every year more than 20 million sorry more than 10 million people search for sudoku and download from the app store so we want when you go and take your phone and search for sudoku in the app store we want to rank number 1 and when that happens, we would get automatically 6 million downloads in the App Store and 12 million downloads in the Google Play Store. So our, our, all the marketing efforts we are putting on is to get make sure that we rank up uh, in the charts and get to number one for search when you search for Sudoku. So this slide actually talks about what the quest model is. You have an engaging story. There are beautiful maps for the user to sort of travel across. There's a sense of progression. Uh, the level design is fair. What I mean by that is we have 400 milestones. People in the last milestone, 400 milestone, 80% of them have not paid us anything at all. So the game is really free to play. It is not like you have to pay to sort of get to the end of the content. And the content is endless. So if you like the game, you can actually be engaged with the game for like more than six months. Next slide, please. Yeah, so you can play on any device, Facebook, iOS, Android, Amazon, or Nokia. We use something called Game Closure and we develop cross-platform. It sort of looks obvious, but all the people, most of the people who are playing in the market, they are at max present in two platforms. Next slide, please. Uh, so the secret sauce that I was mentioning earlier is identify a proven game in the market, proven in terms of traction, uh, people should already be familiar with the mechanic and they'd like to play these games. That should be proven. It may not be monetized well enough. It can be monetized with ads. So identify those games, put our expertise in quest model, put our expertise in app purchases, make it social, make it cross-platform. Do all these five things, then it would monetize the next compared to the competition. That's sort of our strategy going forward. Next slide, please. Yeah, so that's that, that's all I have. So we are, we are raising a $500,000 round. We have already raised 250K. We're looking to raise 250K more. So that that's where we are right now. So you have a um, a, a lead term sheet then, right? You have a value put on the yeah, value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a price round. We we have already used investors committed. Uh, it, it's led by a, an angel in the U.S. and um, the existing investors are also participating. IIM is participating, so yeah. Okay. <coughs> well, good. I think uh, it's an interesting story, actually. Uh, I can see how it progresses. It's uh, it's very easy to see how this progresses, actually. So congratulations. Good job. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Look forward to your premium program. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, Michael Kranitz, you're up next. Hi. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Sramana, uh, and everybody else. Michael Kranitz here from Denver, Colorado. The point of Event Squid is to really consolidate and, if you will, communitize highly active but disaggregated markets um, with broad and deep event management software. So what we'd like to do is leverage the intensity and loyalty of hobbyists and enthusiasts in gun shooting, archery, radio control, biking, uh, physique contest, et cetera, and provide them with a software platform that not only allows them to manage their events, but also consolidates those events into a central a place for vendors, spectators, participants, and event hosts and then syndicate that within the industry, okay? So if, um, take the next slide, uh, and, and these slides are somewhat gratuitous, uh, but if we look at the existing event sites right now, so Eventbrite or Black Tire, any of the number of sites, they're all silos of uh, events of any different type. You can search for an event of your type, but there's nothing specifically tailored for that industry vertical. So if I'm in archery, I care about IBO events. I care about Vegas contests. You, most people wouldn't even know what these are, but I want to search by those things. And when I get to that site, I want to feel like I'm on a site that's meant for me. So all of the trade dress, all of the advertisements, all of the photos and videos on our sites, each of which can be set up for an industry in less than 48 hours on the same platform, is customized in their categories, in their vernacular, in the advertisements and the trade dress to, for that community. 
Moreover, the advertising opportunities on there for the vendors are targeted. So if, for example, I'm on a radio control site and I sell radio control warbirds, I can put my coupons that I can generate on the site on just the warbird events. So what I'm trying to do as an overview is provide a very broad and deep software management for your events, including scoring, uh, you know, payment, accounting, compliance documents, hotels, badges, labels, everything you can imagine, but then stick it in the community where people are more likely to return and be loyal to the process. Next slide. So if you look at, if you look at current sites, you, these are the things that are broken. Basically, uh, people have a free form ability to post events. They look different. It's difficult to find things. So we, instead of having the user try to create a website and users are notoriously uncreative in that respect and create confusing listings, we create standardized listing for the user with an event builder. It's like a wizard takes them through the process. It's, it can be very simple or for the power user can be very powerful. Two, uh, if you back out a step, the whole reason that we're needed is because in these markets, which are highly active, but very inefficient and disaggregated, you have uh, event hosts using spreadsheets, paper forms, uh, copying and pasting, Word, label programs, et cetera. So we dispense with all that and we'll save about 25 to 40 hours of planning for an event host. So the software itself is, is quite powerful. The information here is, is not syndicated. Again, I, I might have to dip into 10 different forums to find a specific type of gun shooting event within 300 miles of me on the week I have a vacation in July, for example. So there's no information syndication currently in these markets that we look at. And finally, there's very low vendor integration, meaning it's a banner ad here, it's a, it's a display ad there, whatever it is. And so what we do is we have, next slide, uh, we have tools that address that with vendors. So in other words, you can request donations as an event host from a whole host of vendors on our site and then they can respond through a panel that we provide um, so that vendors feel like they're part of the process. And of course, on the advertising side, as I said, it's, um, it's, it's integrated within the context of the event. So if I'm an advertiser and I say, hey, I only want to advertise on events in the Northeast that have to do with 3D shooting and uh, target shooting, whatever it is. Next slide. Yeah, skip that next one and, and then the one after that. So what we did, what we did is we made the calendar uh, portable. Uh, you can, if you're an event host, or excuse me, if you're anybody in the industry, you can customize our calendar to show the types of events that you like or all of them. And you could drop that calendar in various iterations on your website. That means that centralized database, but distributed content. The person, the hosts that are posting events now know that if they post their event once, it'll get seen on hundreds of different sites. And of course, this is self updating content for the host of the calendar. It's great for their social um, uh, reach and they don't have to do anything. They just drop the calendar in. Next slide. So, uh, let's uh, and then, yeah, Hold on. yeah, go ahead. Uh, so you are proposing to ho to have like a central repository of industry events collected in a central calendar and then people in the nodes, the different associations and clubs, and um, they can basically show a selection, a curated selection of those events in a version of that calendar on their websites. That's correct, and you've led into a great point. Uh, if you give me the next slide, we not only, the, the set of tools that we provide the event hosts is so broad and deep that it easily eclipses what they can get on any of the generic event sites. So we also give away, we also provide turnkey websites for clubs. So they can now host their club on our site, collect membership dues and all of that, and then their event calendar is automatically published not only on their club site, but of course on all the other sites in the industry. 
Um, if you go to the next slide, what you'll see, uh, this is the this is the vendor queue. Skip that and go to the next one. I just got it through these. There's this is uh, this is an example of a of a turnkey website for a club, and the club's calendar would appear under upcoming events. So even non public events like club meetings, we have to mow the lawn or take care of the archery range or the you know whatever it is, those will appear on the calendar. The point here is to get use the enthusiasm, the loyalty of the individual A to their club and B to their sport or hobby and give them a single place to go. So if I, if I register for an event in Florida and I'm an archer and then I decide to go to one in Nebraska, the system already has my information, my membership numbers, everything I need, and it takes me about 30 seconds to register for a new event. So it's a, it's, it's, four or five different things combined in one. It is for the event host, it's a turnkey solution to host my event. It's also turnkey solution for distributing and promoting my event within the industry. For vendors, it's an avenue to talk specifically to the types of events I want and the audience I want. Now, the business model behind this is somewhat in flux, Sramana. I could have funded this, self-funded this with cash and just gone out and marketed the crap out of it. But within each vertical, I think it's really important to have subject matter experts running that business. So what I did in archery is I got a group of people, three people who are affiliated in the archery industry and very well connected, and I did a deal with them where they are literally licensed equity participants, if you will. So they're taking X percent of the net they can be cut off if they don't meet thresholds and I, the rights snap back to me. But in the meantime, they're out promoting and selling the archery, uh, archeryevents.com as their own business. And I take the gross and support the software. And of course, the platform is all the same. It's, there are slight differences like in the scoring modules for archery and scoring for something else. But that's the business model that I've undertaken thus far. It's unclear to me. Yep, go ahead. So what is the business model? How do you make money? So uh, you, you make money on a number of different revenue streams. A, if uh, you, make, uh, you take a piece of all the registration dollars that go through the system. B, you, there are ample advertising and couponing opportunities that we take uh, a, a, percent, a percentage of. Three, if a club hosts their website, we take a piece of all the membership money because they use our system to handle online payment for your, your membership dues. And okay. finally, there's licensing fees. If we use a partner, right, um, there are licensing fees for them to use the software. So imagine in gun shooting, if I, I go to, let's say, Cabela's and say, would you like to own the experience of all these gun shooting events like Red Bull does for air events? You can own the site, and then you pay a license fee, and, and on you go. So that's – yeah, the rest – I mean, you know, the slides are whatever. Uh, <laughs> what are your questions? So, you know, my, my questions here um, – and, and, oh, actually, yeah, I did have a couple of slides. It's – I think it, it, it's unclear to me what I would like assistance with finding industry savvy partners within each vertical to really run with the marketing and the promotion of these centralized event sites within each vertical because they have the subject matter expertise and they have the industry contacts. I, of course, can support the process along the way, but I still think that's the best way to go. If it's not, then a more standard way of taking in a certain amount of funding and going in and just hammering the markets with cash, right, and, and spreading the word and doing it ourselves, yeah, I still don't think that's optimal. So my, my real need is finding partners who can help us get placed within biking, within, you know, all these different verticals that we have good domains for and that we can attack. 
So you, uh, what are you doing to find those? There is there are umpteen groups, right? Social media groups of various kinds where people congregate. You know, people of different interest areas congregate. You, you know, uh, just dipping into social media. I need I need major players within these industry verticals, um, and and so. I, you know, I think it's much better to come in. Let me, let's, let me cut through the chase, Michael. I'm not going to find those for you. You're going to have to find them yourself. Okay. So if you're coming to 1 million by 1 million, expecting that we are going to find these contacts for you, we're not going to do that. No, I, I'm not expecting you. No, 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 no. Sramana, I, I was looking for a dialogue about the smartest way to scale this with different verticals. So, so the my opinion is that the smartest way to find them would be to find administrators of groups. You know, what do they tell you? If somebody is administering a big hobby group, what does that tell you about that person? He or she is passionate about that topic. And very likely, administrators, administrators of groups like that have contacts, know people, and, and maybe willing to do something with you along the lines of what you're proposing. So that would be, if I were to do this search, this is where I would go. Okay, I appreciate that. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, Steve Woolridge, you're next. Yes, thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to um, to join with you today, and I appreciate to thank everybody for joining in uh, for the discussion. Um, I'm also going to be, Michael kind of set me up here because he's talking about event-based uh, markets, and I'm going to be talking basically in the same, same area. So let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, again, I'm Steve Aldridge. I'm the owner of Blue Skies Franchising, but I'm also acting as Director of Business Development uh, for a company called Life at Play, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, you can get more information at lifeatplayphoto.com. We've also got a Facebook page set up, uh, Facebook at Life at Play. Uh, and there's a YouTube video uh, link there that uh, lets you see the system in operation so you can see what we're talking about. Next slide, please. Okay, so what is Life at Play? It's basically an event-based photo entertainment service, uh, and it is focused on supporting two primary markets, two primary uh, uh, groups of people. The first are corporate sponsors that are trying to reach participants of events, um, like, uh, for example, an NFL game where you'll have uh, Budweiser or other sponsors trying to pull people in and promote their, their product uh, at that event. So what Life at Play does is it pulls event participants into the corporate sponsored area. It's a very advanced uh, photo station with a Bose sound system, with a laser light show, uh, it's just it's a, it's a very fun type of uh, service, and it provides for the participants and on behalf of the sponsor a quality photo gift. It's a it's a very high quality picture of them and their friends or family or whatever they can take in you know, on one picture, one person or or twenty. Um, it's not a photo booth. It's a wide open photo station. It also collects the participant contact information for the uh, sponsor's future use. And on the picture itself, the sponsor's logo, their taglines, those sort of things are all on there. So that the picture itself, the takeaway of themselves, also contains the corporate sponsor's information. It also facilitates the posting of the event information and the sponsor information to multiple social media sites, including at the, at, during the event itself. They will basically uh, transmit a copy of the electronic picture to their smartphone, to their tablet, allowing the participants to upload the, um, the, the pictures to Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or wherever they want to put it uh, immediately while the event is going on. So that's the primary focus. That's where most of the, the profit and money is made associated with this service. Uh, they also uh, support other types of events which are non-sponsored or non-marketing type events like weddings, parties, uh, family reunions, uh, other type of corporate gatherings, uh, and, and has some benefit because, again, it very, adds a lot of fun to the event. Next slide, please. 
So this is the general market we're operating within. Uh, in, the, in 2012, there were almost 2 million business events where this service would uh, potentially uh, apply. 1.3 million corporate events that were marketing focused, uh, about 270,000 conferences, about 10,000 trade shows attended by over 200 million people. Now that doesn't include all of the personal events, all the weddings, parties, dances, uh, family reunions, all the other things that are also going on on a continuing basis. Next slide, please. Uh, the so business itself it is established in St. Louis. Uh, it recently was was uh, announced that they are now the official official photo station of the St. Louis Rams, which means that they're at all of the home games. Uh, they're at all the uh, public events that the Rams organization puts on. So that they're out there, they're at all these events. And one of the nice things about this is that when they're promoting the sponsor, they're also promoting themselves. Also, the service is there. Uh, they get a lot of business from people that come up to them and say, I'd like to have you at my event. So it's kind of a self-promotional thing while they're actually earning money promoting the other organizations. So what they're looking to do, the business is established in St. Louis, but we want to create uh, a licensing opportunity that we can uh, have this ex expand across the U.S. We're also looking to expand international markets, but right now primarily U.S. market. What's the intellectual property against which you're licensing? This is a service. If somebody needs a camera, a good photographer, a photo station, what is what is what is the, special the, about that? The, what's what's special about this is the is the combination of the photo station, which includes obviously the camera, which has uh, proprietary software built into it to make sure that you can get the best quality picture. We've got uh, we've got a group that uh, used to, it was a group that way back when Sears okay. photos. This is not well, Today, there are umpteen great cameras, umpteen great photographers. You sure. know, amateur. The quality of amateur photography has gone up tremendously. So I, I don't think it's credible. What you're saying is not credible. Well, I think it is because it's it's just not the picture. It's the combination of the Bose sound system, the laser light show, uh, the uh, again quality of the picture. But also the collection for the for the for the sponsor of their uh, contact information of the participants, uh, having all those all those pictures posted everywhere with their taglines, with their uh, with their logos on it. It's, it's, it's a workflow. So and so St. Much, Louis is extremely it's popular. Intellectual property. It's a workflow that you have developed that you are replicating elsewhere. So yes, that's uh, correct. How how big is the penetration in St. Louis? Uh, they they have about uh, six of uh, these stations that they operate on a, a continuing basis. They're probably doing around uh, maybe 350000 a year. Okay. So, I mean, this is not so complicated to expand. You've got a formula that is working in St. Louis. You just, I mean, you don't even need to license anything. You just hire people and... and and uh, set it up elsewhere. Why do you need to even hire? Why do you need to even in license? Well, that's just the that's the that's the that's the avenue we've taken. We figure that we can. One of the just one of the owners of this is a one of the top franchise attorneys in the country. Uh, and while this isn't classified as a franchise, it has most of the characteristics of a franchise. So I think that's part of the. Uh, part of the reason that we've developed it like this and we've put together a business opportunity um, which provides you know, the ability for someone to be set up in business and get all the corporate support to have them be successful. Um, it's like a franchise, but it doesn't have all of the individual characteristics of a franchise. Okay. okay? What is your question? Uh, basically, we're looking at uh, moving this into the 15 top metro areas in the country, which we think captures about 70% of that total market that we were talking about before. Um, and you go to the next slide, please, if you would. Uh, we're looking basically for people that are outgoing, sociable, that would, and they want to be in business for themselves. Uh, and we're doing some things to, to look for these people. We're members of an organization called the Franchise Broker Association, which has 280 business brokers that are now promoting the service uh, using Google AdWords and select markets, uh, going through social media to identify, permanently LinkedIn and Facebook to identify the people. 
we're just trying, we're looking for uh, other thoughts on what other methods could we use to identify within these major areas uh, the potential people to license the technology. You should look in photography, social media sites. People, there are you know, a lot of photographers who are looking for additional business revenue channels. You should look in those areas. Okay. I think uh, that would be my uh, instinct. It's not so much the franchise business brokers who would be able to find you, the people who are looking to do this, but, but you, I mean, maybe they would, but, uh, but I think there's a better way of finding the kind of people who will naturally gravitate towards something like this. Okay. All right, so your, your, your thoughts on social media would be the place to start and look for groups like photographers that would be yeah. a good source. Okay. All right, okay. thanks. You're welcome. Paul Dunalescu, next. Yes, so we saved the for last, I see. <laughs> um, okay, so let me get started. I'm just going to go with a, a little bit of background on how I got started on the company called Newsly. Um, I moved to London about two years ago uh, from New York, and basically uh, I'm an avid reader of newspapers and magazines, and uh, once I got to London, um, I lost all my Barnes & Noble uh, book access and magazine access, and uh, when I went online to um, cover Did, uh, can you hear audio, folks? I lost my audio. Right. False audio has stopped. There we go. Maureen, we have one more presenter, or is Paul the last one? All right, let's uh, let's give Paul a moment to sort out his audio issues. In the meantime, let's spend some time going over uh, one million by one million, and then we will come back to Paul when his audio comes back alive. So, if you like, by the way, what we are doing here, uh, our request to you is. Please refer us to serious entrepreneurs. And the reason I emphasize on the word serious is that we do not make any, you know, unworthy claims that you can be an overnight success in entrepreneurship. There is no silver bullet. Entrepreneurship is immensely difficult, and you really have to put in a tremendous amount of work to be successful as an entrepreneur. And it takes years to build a successful company. And that's the kind of entrepreneur we are looking for who has the stomach to give what it takes to his or her venture to you know, build over many years and seriously block by block. We're not looking for people who are trying to kind of make a quick buck. That's just not the kind of entrepreneur that we are interested in working with. So everything in terms of resources, you will find everything at 1mby1m.com. From there on, uh, you, can, you can definitely follow the blog. There is a very, very high quality blog attached to the program. And our book series, the Entrepreneur Journeys book series, is also extremely effective in bringing you role models and case studies of how successful entrepreneurs have built their companies and how they have navigated the different issues that they have to deal with. So um, on your screen, there are eight books. This fall, we're going to release three more Entrepreneur Journeys books, and then in January, we'll release another book. So uh, next week, in fact, as early as next week, we're going to be releasing the e-commerce um, book that uh, you will see a lot of information on very soon. Uh, everything is on Kindle at this point. So our a Kindle or Kindle app on any of the smartphones anywhere. Um, so feel free to 
look at these. This is a very good entry point into the 1M1M one one program between the blog, the free roundtables, and the book series. You have a you know, relatively low-priced entry point into the 1M1M one one program. The blog is free. The roundtables are free. The books are very inexpensive. And then you have um, the premium program, which is slightly more expensive. Um, the blog also has a ton of, this is what the site looks like, by the way. Um, we also have a ton of video FAQs. If you're trying to evaluate the program, that's where you need to go to, to kind of educate yourself. We don't try to sell very much. We kind of expect that if you are going to be an online learner, you must be a self-starter and you must be able to dig around in our website and, and figure out, make the decision for yourself whether you want to work with the one and one program or not. Um, and that decision is yours. And, and you must understand what it entails to be part of the one and one program. Uh, this is our 227th free roundtable. Uh, we are actually looking at about 25,000 people that have attended the program so far in the free mode. Um, you can register at the free public roundtables um, slot. Uh, you know, the navigation bar up there, up on the top left corner, has the registration links and the dates and times and everything. So I strongly recommend if you're looking for a slot to present, you are, uh, you should register there, and Maureen will try to, uh, you know, schedule you. Uh, one thing we're going to start doing from this fall is a portion of the roundtable is going to have uh, a guest. So we're going to have a bit of a talk show, and uh, many of them are going to be investors and you know industry experts who are going to be sharing their knowledge and advice based on which you can navigate your journeys through the entrepreneurial waters. So we're going to expand and include more, pe more industry experts in the programming. Um, the one and one premium membership consists of extensive methodology guidance on how to put one foot before the other. We have a very strong curriculum that has been developed over a long period of time and has been enriched every month uh, ever since we started. Um, we do a lot of business development work. We introduce our entrepreneurs to potential customers, channel partners, media, analysts, investors, of course, those who are fundable, and advisors. So, and, and then we have a version of these kinds of roundtables that we use for to do the strategy consulting, which is interactive mentoring, consulting, coaching, whatever you call it. But it's the interactive feedback part of the program. That's members only. We call them private roundtables. Um, so these that those are all, you know, part of the premium program. That's just a thousand dollar annual membership fee. Um, you can look at the Million Dollar Club to meet some, you know, case studies of successful premium members. The one and one in value equation, the ROI equation of one and one M, is really strong. If you try to access the level of value that we offer here, if you try to access that in the open market by buying services from service providers, you're going to it will cost you $375,000 plus 5 to 10% equity to get the value that we offer for just $1,000 annual membership fee. So it's a very, very high value program, and we'll give you lots of orientation on how to use the program, but you do need to pay attention on how to use the program. It is a unique program. It is different from what's out there. It is different from how most accelerators work. It is very much you know, a self-learning, guided learning program with a very distinct methodology. The methodology is very different from what most incubators and accelerators follow. Um, so you have to kind of you know, buy into that methodology, and, and it is working. So you have to, however, commit to following that methodology and doing the heavy lifting, the work yourself. It is like a gym in that sense. You, know, you can't really buy a gym membership and expect that you're going to get in shape in by, like, you know, in by some stroke of magic. That's not how it operates, right? To, get, to be in shape, once you get your gym membership, you have to do the work. You have to lift the weights. You have to run on the treadmill. You have to work with the trainers, blah, blah, blah. And that's exactly what the philosophy of this program is. You have to do a lot of work to really get value out of the program 
using what we are going to offer you in the program in terms of methodology, in terms of case studies, in terms of video lectures. You have to study those. Um, the one and one in self-assessment, you can take a look at that. These are questions you should be asking yourself. It's important that you think of yourself as an investor in your own business and, and answer these questions and try to get to meaningful answers to these questions. Um, the premium program has lots of material on, available on the website through which you can evaluate. You can go through your own evaluation process. And we see a lot of people who just you know, study the website and make the decision on joining the program and, and they just sign up online and they're part of the program and they start using it. So it's been a fairly you know, effective way of communicating all the FAQs and everything through little videos and so forth. That makes it, you know, it's not salesy, it's basically you decide whether you want to join the program or not. Now, I want to give you a couple of thoughts on how we have designed the curriculum, but it's really important. Um, we have been developing case studies of successful entrepreneurs who have built substantial revenues in the program since 2006. This was long before the 1M1M one &one program in its current incarnation or current shape was launched. It wasn't even conceived. 1M1M one &one was conceived as my New Year resolution in January of 2010. So, uh, and then we launched the program at the end of 2010, so we're just coming up to four years of running this program. But the uh, case study development started long before the program started. So we have, you know, we have done a tremendous amount of mentoring. The free mentoring session, this is our 227th. And then we have, remember, we have all these private mentoring sessions as well as part of the premium program. So we have a tremendous experience mentoring entrepreneurs at this point at a very large scale. And we've been able to triangulate the two bodies of work, the mentoring work where we learn what kinds of issues you are facing as entrepreneurs and how to mitigate those issues. And we also work with all these successful entrepreneurs who can throw light on those issues, on how you, you know, navigate those issues, how you get around those issues, and um, you know, how you address specific challenges. And we have stitched all that up into a really powerful curriculum that's working extremely well um, and is, has been enriched every month. The core curriculum consists of seven major topics, bootstrapping, positioning, market sizing, customer validation, financing, customer acquisition, and team building. And then on the elective side, we have uh, modules that are aligned to specific industry areas or specific core areas that may be of interest, like Web 3.0 and e-commerce, cloud computing and business solutions, mobile and social apps, outsourcing and consulting, gaming, healthcare IT, online education. We have added a couple of new modules in the electives. One is for women entrepreneurs, uh, because that topic has been you know, developing a lot in the media on the kinds of challenges and issues that women are facing. Um, and then we also have one that is uh, unicorns, building unicorn companies. These are billion dollar companies, and we have a lot of successful case, of, a, a lot of case studies of successful entrepreneurs who've built billion dollar companies and we have uh, made an attempt to study their techniques and, and tricks of the trade and, and, uh, and we've created a, an elective module around unicorns as well. So, uh, so this is a very, very powerful curriculum. I would say this is one, one of the most powerful curriculums on entrepreneurship around anywhere in the world today. Our methodology is lean, capital efficient, bootstrap startups. This is not to say that we discourage you from raising money, not at all. We have companies that have raised plenty of money in the program, um, so we have absolutely no problem with helping you raise money. However, the way the industry stands today, you will need to bootstrap the early stages of the business to enough validation so that you can become or you may become fundable. So you have to mentally adjust your expectations to be able to do an extended period of bootstrapped, lean, capital efficient business building such that you can later qualify for funding if that's the direction you want to go and that's the direction your business lets you go. Not every business is fundable, you know. 
there are many more $5 million, $10 million, $20 million, $50 million ideas which are not necessarily venture fundable than billion dollar ideas that VCs are looking for. Uh, coverage of premium members. So this is part of the work with, that we do with the media. We help you get a lot of media coverage, both through our own various syndicated columns, our own platforms and so forth, as well as working with other journalists and media people that we have relationships with. So getting coverage is important, and getting coverage is very hard. So especially companies who do not have big funding announcements to make, it is very, very difficult to get uh, coverage. So you do need to use channels that work. And then we also give you extensive use of our social media channels, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. We are very, very present on those. And if you're following us, you know how present we are in those channels. And we do let you propagate your messages through those channels as well. Our blog is another social media channel where we cover you and give you exposure through. We do have an affiliate program. The affiliate program is applicable to those who have either you know, entrepreneurship media uh, assets that you're trying to monetize, or you have entrepreneurship development programs in different geographies or an incubator that you want to partner with us, you could use the affiliate program to do so. Um, we have a roundtable every Thursday, 8 a.m. Pacific in September. Actually, all September, October, we have pretty much full schedule of roundtables. Um, then we have a book called Vision India 2020, which is mostly for developing economies, not just India, or it applies to Africa, Latin America, and so forth. This is a, a book that is written as business fiction, and as if we are sitting in 2020 having built these $45 billion ideas. And it's basically an ideation book. So if you're still looking for an idea, you can um, go and, and look for um, ideas in this book, and you're very welcome to execute on any of them. We do have an elective module on the Vision India 2020 ideas. You can use that to, to work with us as well. So, so you're, feel free to steal, morph, borrow, any, whatever you want to do with these ideas. Then we have the incubator in a box. The one on one incubator in a box is a platform that en enables anyone anywhere in the world to set up an incubator or to expand the capabilities of an existing incubator. So we're working with a lot of corporate partners right now who are offering their own incubation programs on top of our platform. Um, we can also do that with angel investors, VCs, governments, schools, you know, colleges, universities, entrepreneurship development organizations, anybody, anywhere in the world, if you're looking for a you know, direct and deep partnership with Silicon Valley and, and access to the Silicon Valley network and a global net network of entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship ecosystems, we are here to work with you. It's a very straightforward, very, um, you know, very easy model to work with. There are a bunch of uh, books. These are the last four books. Uh, you're going to see a lot more coming out from our shop. Um, so we can actually take some questions from the audience. These are, this is the dial-in line. Now, is Paul planning to come back? It doesn't look like Paul has sorted out his technical issues. So Tushar Sayankar, if you would like to call in, you're welcome to do so. Anybody else? Questions, comments? You can introduce yourself. This is also a networking uh, platform. So wherever you are, whatever you're working on, please feel free to come and introduce yourselves and tell us who you are, what you're working on. And we also like to know how you found out about 1M1M. So use the public chat for this, by the way. Uh, set your public chat, to, set your chat window to send to all participants and then you have access to the public chat. Anybody? Sushara, are you dialed in? 
Yeah, hi, uh, Samana. Yeah, this hi, is uh, Tushar, Tushar here. Is, uh, Tushar here. Uh, make sure your computer is turned off, otherwise you're going to generate echoes into the call. Yeah, I, I did it just now. All right, go ahead. So uh, uh, if you remember, I was a premium member for uh, 1M by 1M two years back, and it was very helpful. So from that point, we I worked really hard, and last year we got two customers. Uh, one of the uh, one of the customer was from Georgia State. It's a non-profit organization, so they used our platform to uh, launch their same uh, quiz bowl throughout the state. And uh, first quiz bowl happened in May, so we were very successful in that. And we got a second customer, which is in Paid More. Uh, it's a company from California, and it's a B2B uh, uh, business. And uh, we are going. Uh, we are going to get a lot of business uh, from her because uh, we have a upfront uh, cost we charged, and then we are getting 25% of uh, per participant per per year, whatever contents uh, they are delivering it to the schools and uh, large organizations. So that is uh, one of our first success. And then we launched another uh, uh, product, uh, a similar product for corporate training, uh, universities and colleges. Uh, we call it QuizDrill.com. And it's, again, same e-learning quizzing platform where you can deliver your video contents, uh, images, uh, presentations. Uh, uh, you can offer quizzes in that, and then it collects all the statistics at one place for each participant. Uh, owner of that, uh, uh, basically, uh, community can uh, see all the statistics of, of their uh, entire class. Uh, at, uh, you, know, uh, you can deliver certificates, custom certificates. Uh, and this this is branded uh, for you. So, for example, if uh, we have to do it for 1M by 1M, uh, we, we will provide the registration form or sign-up form link, which will be branded on your with your uh, logo, banner, and uh, your promotional contents, your books, where you can, they can, uh, you know, uh, look at uh, your uh, curriculum and uh, attend that in a free or paid mode. So, uh, uh, Shramana, I was wondering if you would be interested to see this uh, platform and uh, for your 1M by 1M uh, curriculum. Sure, I, to the... let me just not waste your time. We don't have any bandwidth right now. We have an absolute chock full next six months. We have four books coming out. We have an immense amount of corporate business going on right now, plus our, uh, you know, all the members that are already in the program, new members coming in. We have a big partnership that we're doing with LinkedIn with their influencer program. So, I mean, I just don't have any bandwidth. And we have no need to change platforms right now. Our platform is working very well. So I don't think we can, we can give you the time right now, and, and it's not a priority for us at all to change platforms. Yeah, so this will be basically integrated with your uh, uh, website, Shramana. It, and and uh, uh, as far as bandwidth is concerned, uh, I think we can uh, definitely help uh, in all aspects of uh, uh, this implementation. But uh, I'm, I'm just asking like 10 minutes of uh, your time to see the demo, and then uh, you can decide what uh, whether you really uh, like it or want to move so forward. I think or a not. more productive uh, use of your time, Tushar, would be, and this is what I think uh, Irina suggested to you, is that you should do a, a, pres a pitch, a roundtable pitch in one of the upcoming roundtables, so not only me, but you can explain your platform, what it does, and, and how it does what it does to uh, the you know larger audience, and, and see who is interested. Maybe I'd be interested, maybe other people would be interested, but use the roundtable to pitch your product. Okay, I think that's a good idea. I will uh, uh, utilize I, your... I can give you other ideas then on how to build the business as well. Okay, I think that sounds like a good idea. Okay, great. Anybody else? Any other questions, comments? So while you're thinking about what you want to ask, here's uh, somebody you should meet. Irina Patterson on the 1M1M team will be happy to talk to you if you have questions about the 1M1M Premium Program. If you are considering joining and if you'd like to talk, for, talk to someone by Skype or phone uh, or email with somebody, Irina would be your contact person. Her phone number is 786-301-2456. Her email is irina at 1mby1m.com, and Skype ID is irina underscore Patterson. So feel free to, uh, to communicate with Irina if you would like to. And if anybody has any other questions or comments, please 
go ahead and either dial in or ask in public chat, and I'd be happy to tackle those questions. Doesn't look like Paul was able to get back on, huh? No? Nobody has any further questions? In which case, we'll adjourn for today, and we will see you back here on, uh, at the next roundtable next Thursday, and there will be a guest next Thursday. So I'm not going to tell you who it is, but uh, you have to come back to find out who it is. <laughs> it would be fun, though. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Enjoy the last uh, bit of summer that is left, and uh, we all will have to get back working really hard this fall. Bye-bye.